the revised agenda on April 27th, 2021 at 3 p.m. Item number one, there are revisions made to the attachments. Okay, let's get this meeting started with the Pledge of Allegiance, if you'll please join me. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to call the meeting to order. Individuals wishing to address the City Council are requested to complete a speaker card and deliver the card to the City Clerk staff prior to the item being heard by the City Council. Please observe a three-minute limit for communications, and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and City of Residence for the record. Moving on to the communications from the public. Uh, this portion of the agenda is intended for general public comment. Um, only on items within the Council's jurisdiction that are not listed elsewhere on the agenda. Please note that state law prohibits the City Council from discussing or taking action on these items. Please observe a three-minute limit for communications, and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and city of residence for the record. Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards or written comments for communication from the public? Mayor, yes, I have one speaker card. All right. Well, we'd love to have you. Ask off to do this. Okay. Hi, I'm Maddie Paxton. I am in District 1 in the city of Corona. And as you can see, I'm going to step away for one second. I'm representing Voices for Children. Um, I was excited when a friend pointed out to me that you have on your proposed budget a line item for Voices for Children, which is the CASA organization. I am a volunteer. I've been a volunteer technically since um, June, but I didn't get started till August. And just to give you a little background, the CASA organization is a nationwide organization. Um, it's a court-appointed special advocates for kids in foster care. As we know, unfortunately, a lot of the kids that are removed from homes typically are for abuse or, and or neglect. And they're moved from house to house till they can find some kind of permanent living situation. It is extremely rewarding. Um, I don't have, and my kids are grown up, I don't have grandkids, and this has become my second family. And I can't even begin to tell you how much I get so much more back than what I give. We um, meet with our kids, generally speaking, about maybe 10 hours a month, and my job is to write reports that go straight to the judge, the attorneys, and the social workers. I get to stay with this child for 18-month commitment, and some of the classes have been with their kids for five years. Again, been, since they, like most kids get placed, have one, more than one placement, they don't have an adult that's continuous in their life. So at least we stay with them and they know that they can count on us. Um, I work with, my child is seven years old and does not live in the city of Corona because they placed me with a child in elementary level. I have an elementary school background, so that's how I was placed. I did find out that there are um, three offices of Voices for Children in Riverside County. One, the one that I work with is in Riverside. There's one in Murrieta and one in Palm Desert, and no, there will not be one open in the city of Corona. The money will be spent for kids here in Corona to continue the program. And if anybody has any questions um, about considering this, please contact me or contact Voices for Children because you'll absolutely give back, get back so much more than you can give knowing that you can help the life of a child. And to you council members, please know at night that you have done a, an amazing thing by adding this and you are helping kids in the community. So I can't begin to thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your volunteerism. I know that your consistent support in that child's life is certainly making a difference and we're happy to support through the CDBG grant. Um, so thanks for those comments. Um, Ms. Edwards, are there any other speaker cards? No, there are not. Okay, okay let's jump into our one and only agenda item. Uh, Ms. Sitton, Administrative Services Director, was going to provide a report. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you. 
Um, we did meet two weeks ago and talked about the estimated revenues and baseline operating budgets for the different departments. And so today we're here to discuss the um, capital improvement projects, um, the service change requests, which are the, the new um, operating items to be included in the operating budget, as well as the total measure X allocations. A couple things to note is there's a budget resource manual that the finance department has prepared. Uh, it was pre prepared about two years ago, but we've gone through and updated that and made a new copy available on the city's website on the finance page. And there's also copies, hard copies available for uh, you, the council, for your notebooks as well. Uh, so one thing before we get started, I wanted to address there was a question from Council Member Daddario at the last budget workshop that was asking what the budget was in 2007. Uh, we had a chart up that was showing the number of full-time positions in 2007, which was pre-recession, and then what the, the number of full-time positions is going to be in the next fiscal year, not yet considering these service change requests. So in fiscal year 2007, the total operating budget was $266.9 million with 887 full-time positions. In fiscal year 2022, the baseline operating budget, again not considering these new service change requests, was 290 or is 295 million with 661 full-time positions. It's an increase of 11% or $28 million. During that same time, PERS has gone up from $15.2 million in 2007 to 30 million in next fiscal year, which is a 97% increase or $14.7 million. So of that, of that $28 million increase over that time period, uh, $14.7 million of that is related directly to PERS. And that's across all funds, not just the general fund. You're welcome. Okay, so we're gonna start off talking about uh, the proposed capital improvement uh, projects for next fiscal year. Attached to the agenda, um, is a list of all the capital improvement projects. There's a list by funding source, as well as a list of all those projects by category, and it has descriptions of the different projects as well. It does break down the, um, the amounts by carryover funding and the new funding for fiscal year 2022. So just to give you a snapshot of next fiscal year, uh, there's a total of 285 projects included in the budget. That's a combination of new and continuing projects. Out of that 285, 60 of them are brand new projects, and the remaining 225 are, like I said, a combination of carryover and new funding. So there's $208.8 million in carryover funding, about $58 million in new funding for a total of $267 million in next fiscal year. So looking at the fiscal year 2022 CIP budget by category, uh, this just breaks it down by the different types of projects. Like I said, it's a total of $58.2 million. And the largest categories that we have are water projects, uh, streets and storm drain projects, and then facilities and community asset projects. And then just taking a, just a different slice of the same information to talk about the different funding sources or how those projects will be paid for. In fiscal year 2022, uh, the DWP funds are the largest category. Uh, Road-related funds are the second, and then uh, the general fund is the third category in paying for those different projects. So we'll start off with the electric utility projects. There are a total of nine projects in next fiscal year. Two of those projects have, have a new funding request totaling uh, $225,000 for next fiscal year. That's the electrical infrastructure improvements and the transformer life cycle replacements project. There's a few pro projects that we're gonna highlight as we go through this presentation, but if there's any specific project you'd like us to stop and, and talk about, please let me know. In the facility systems and community assets group, we have a total of 94 projects. The first highlighted one is the City of Corona Public Facilities and Infrastructure, 714,229. That's a CDBG project that was actually discussed at the last Committee of the Whole. 
And then at the bottom of the list here, we have the Comprehensive Fire Apparatus Replacement Program. That number is a placeholder for the moment. We're still evaluating what that actual request will be. Uh, the number would not go higher. It would actually come in um, potentially lower when we bring you the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022. Kim, the, um, the public facilities and infrastructure, that was the senior center? Uh, hold on just a second. Yes, that's correct. That was the senior center project and the other CDGB funding program that we were talking about during the last committee of the whole. Kim, can we go back to the electrical, the electric projects for 2022? It's really fast. Sure. Um, the 299, uh, 245 for Temescal transmission line extension, is that just remaining amounts? Yes. I mean, I, but what, what else, what is that covering that we haven't paid for yet or haven't done yet? So some of that is part of the extension between the, um, crossings in Dos Lagos. We're working on uh, facilitating interconnections between those two. We have one now, um, and that supports that program so that in the event we there's some finalized steps that we need to do with Southern California Edison to finalize that interconnection so that if we were able to take down one substation or the other during certain times, we could backfeed. This is the, the backup for the backup? Backup for the backup. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thanks. Okay, and then, uh, like I mentioned on this slide, the, um, the fire apparatus replacement fund or program, and that when we bring you the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022, we'll have that uh, number just a little bit more uh, finalized. Uh, so the next project is the electronic document management system, and Chris McMasters is going to provide some information on that one. Yeah, this is pretty easy. I hope everyone can hear me over there. But basically, you know, the city produces several hundred thousand documents every every year. And those documents, a lot of times, are filed away in paper systems. And so this is digitizing those, capturing them, classifying those documents, adding some workflow around them, uh, making sure we're archiving them correctly with some versioning, and then just the retention and destruction of those documents as well. So it just adds efficiency across all the city departments. Okay. And then uh, Brian's going to talk to us a little bit about the fire radios replacement. So this is a phase two of a three-phase radio replacement program, bringing us up to current technology. Basically, it's bringing multiple frequencies that are utilized in the area under one radio. So it's referred to as a tri-band radio. So we can have UHF, VHF, and trunked systems. So it's really moving us into the future for long-term sustainability on our radios. And I believe I also have the next one, so I'll just continue with that, which is the self-contained breathing apparatus. So all of you saw firsthand that this is a vital core component of our personal protective equipment. And once again, technology has outpaced what we currently have. Our current equipment um, was purchased in 2008. It is at end of life. This will be a two-phase uh, purchasing program as well. We're trying to not create a bubble for these large purchases and spread them out incrementally so we can effectively plan for the future. One quick question before we change screens. Um, the fire microwave network. Hopefully Chris is still on the line because that's way too advanced for me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, on this one, let me see, because there's a few things that relate to the fire microwave network. Which one are we talking about here? It's on page 12, about half okay, an Okay, yeah, so... Basically, we're replacing um, most all the fire stations are connected by microwave. There's two kind of segments to that. So there's there's a main segment that runs from SDO to City Hall and from Grape Hill to City Hall. So that's sort of our backbone of the microwave infrastructure for them. And then all the fire stations also have microwave units that are pointing back at those locations. And that's how we connect all the fire stations back together. Um, a lot of that, it's just it's antiquated. We've had lots of issues uh, throughout the year, which the chief can testify to. Um, so it's it's modernizing that system, giving it some more continuity and stability than what it has today. I, I just had a, or just last week, I had a conversation with some folks over at AT&T, uh, and they used to have a microwave 
large, very large microwave station they don't have anymore because they said it's very unreliable and that there's a, you know, there's an earthquake or there's any kind of movement and if it's misaligned, it's not usable. So I just, I didn't know. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, I know this was an older system that, that they had. I don't know if we have something different that, that won't get misaligned if there's an earthquake. So it is a more modern system than what, what we used to have. I don't know what they were technically using, but there's a few ways that we're actually approaching this. So one of the ways that we're looking at is, is where is fiber in the city and trying to work with vendors to get more fiber into the city. Currently, the city only has about 26% of it that, that has fiber that's available to it. So that would be the most, uh, I guess, continuous, stable platform you can have is actually fiber. Um, the other part of it is looking at SD-WAN, which is, which is sort of part of you can see it here on this page. What SD-WAN solutions do is it allows us to take multiple types of, um, let's say, bandwidth. So whether that's coming through microwave or DSL or, and sort of splice all those things together so that if one fails, then it continuously fails over to the next. And so that's, we're, so we're trying to roll this up into a, a full uh, solution for the fire department so we have multiple paths basically to get back. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay, and so then the last uh, project we're highlighting in the, this group is the vehicle procurement, and this is based on the city's replacement cycle, and it's just as vehicles come to their end, the end of life um, based on the city's policy, then uh, they're up for replacement, and so that's funding this request. And this next fiscal year, it's about 54 vehicles. Um, a large portion of them are uh, related to police, um, patrol, and traffic vehicles. And in the parks and open space category. One, one question before you move on, I'm sorry. I know that we talked late last year, last year about our vehicle replacement policy. Did we ever revisit that? I don't recall us revisiting that specifically, no. And I don't okay. even remember what it was we wanted to revisit about it, to be honest. I remember we had a conversation about the um, fire apparatus. Um, yeah, it wasn't that. It was... It was um, other vehicle replacements that it seemed to be, they were really programmed for, you know, this policy was written, I think we figured out the policy was written like 15 years ago and vehicles have certainly changed in 15 years. And so I, I think I wanted, I, that was one of the discussions that point, but I, I can go back and look at my notes and try and find it. Yeah, and we'd be happy to revisit that and apologies for not uh, recalling that one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in the parks and open space projects category, we have 38 projects, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Turner to highlight a few of those. So the first one we're going to highlight today is the citywide ADA improvements. Uh, so as many of you know, we have um, ADA projects that have been highlighted throughout our parks, and we are trying to do a phased approach to um, address those concerns. So this is just the installment uh, of those projects this year. Um, those will be at, um, uh, we'll be doing some work at Lincoln Park, we'll be doing some work at Victoria Park, um, but those are the ADA projects that we have for uh, slated to be addressed this year. And then we should have uh, some projects again uh, in, the, uh, in next year's capital budget. Um, we have the demolition of the armory building at City Park. So this has been separated out when this was first brought to you, it was brought to you as a collective um, item. It was the City Park master plan and the demolition of the armory building. So that you have a clear understanding of what that is, we've separated out the demolition from the City Park master plan. Um, and that is an extensive demolition that is going to have a lot of mitigation involved with it because that particular building has quite a bit of asbestos. Uh, and we are experiencing quite a bit of trouble with the building now um, with folks trying to get in there, um, thinking that there's something to, to gain from being inside of that building. Um, and so we feel like it's really, really important that we make sure that that building gets demolished so that we can begin work with sort of a fresh palette as we look at the master plan for City Park. Um, and lastly, the last item I'll be highlighting today is our park amenities replacement phase one. Um, we are going to be bringing back to council on the 19th our facilities and 
uh, parks amenities report. So that has been to our commission. Uh, and that has identified all of the items in our parks, both facilities and amenities, that have reached their natural life. Uh, we have discussed, frankly, with the council that there's been some deferred maintenance issues in our parks. I think you're well aware of those. Um, so this is sort of the first uh, group of items that have reached uh, and have many of them that have surpassed their useful life and need to be replaced. And so this was outlined in the Parks uh, Amenities and Facilities Executive Report, and that will be back to you on um, May 19th. So we can answer particular questions that you have on the which, exactly what items those are uh, when we get those back to you along with the commissioner's comments on parks as they've visited them as well. Dr. Turner, does that 1.1 million, is that, uh, <clears throat> I know I'm asking you ahead of you giving us the report, but because uh, <laughs> uh, I can't help it. Um, is this the first year of a 10-year plan, first year of a five-year plan? I think that, I think that it, is, it, is, it is what we know immediately needs to be addressed, and then we will talk to you about a longer plan of investment to look at um, and I think it's 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 up to the pleasure of the council. So we're going to give you some options, uh, like we like to do, about whether or not you want to sort of repair um, items or replace items. And so those have different tickets uh, with them. So we can get more into that when I have the report uh, in front of you so we can walk through that. Um, but yes, this is sort of... When we talked um, a while ago, we talked about getting to a baseline. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of that, that one-time investment to get us to the baseline. This is really just taking the things that are really broken and need to be out of the park um, and replacing them mm -hmm. now so we can get to a baseline where we look at a further process of how we, we go on to an incremental yearly replacement schedule. And Vice Mayor Speak, just to add on to that, as you recall when we talked about Measure X and the need to address some of the parks issues that we have, at that time we we saw it being about 800000 to a million dollars a year on an ongoing basis to really properly have an asset management plan that would fund all of the replacement as playgrounds age. You know, they they get a lot of wear and tear and we're really glad about that. Uh, but that's that's kind of the order of magnitude. Of course, we'll know that better, those numbers better once we get our uh, parks and Recreation Master Plan done, and we really have a full inventory of all of those assets, as well as what our preferred uh, service standards are for them. So that's work in progress, but you can expect that this is really year one of many years of investments in parks. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'm excited to see that's that's a good number. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you know we're if if this is getting us to a baseline, that that makes you feel better. Um, but yeah, definitely that that there's an investment that that's much needed there. Thank you. Okay, and then the last slide here wraps out the parks and open space uh, grouping, and this just shows uh, the remainder of carryover funding uh, for this group. So we're going to move on to streets and storm drain projects. And I'm going to turn it over to Savat to highlight some of the projects in this group. Okay, this is um, the uh, alley improvements here. Um, we are beginning to uh, initiate this project. Um, we had uh, applied for CDBG funding for alleys, but it wasn't successful. So we decided to program it in here for uh, the alley improvements here. The first couple million dollars that we're asking for is actually for the design of all of the alleys that will begin at the inner circle and the outer circle. Um, we can play around with it if this project moves forward, that we can design the first million dollars and then construct the next million. But the total cost of all the improvements of the alleys and the inner circle and the outer circle is $22 million of construction. So about $1 million is a design of the inner circle, $1 million is a design of the outer circle. So this is just to begin that project process. The, uh, the next one is the annual street pavement improvement rehabilitation project. And this is our annual pavement rehabilitation. We actually, if you look at the funding, there's a carryover and a proposed uh, amount. It's actually, um, we're, we actually have the 2020 and 2021 fiscal year going out to bid, and we should be having bids uh, next week, I believe. Yeah, next week is bid openings. We're going to bring you to City Council on, on May 19th, um, the actual award of the project for the, for the 2021 fiscal year. But as you can see here, this is 
in common, the funding that we're requesting is proposed for the next fiscal year. So as soon as we begin construction on that, we're going to design it immediately and then bring that to you in the summer for construction of the next fiscal year. So we're really moving ahead to make sure we draw down on our Measure A fundings and other funding grants. One before we move on. Um, I see $4.6 million for Calico I-15 interchange improvements. What, do we know that that's, I mean, that project is done. What, what is that $4 million for? Let's see here. What, what page are we on there? Page 18 of the descriptions. So we're, we're cleaning up on that project right now. We're in the plant establishment per period. We're still um, doing some more finances. I do notice some of the projects that are here that are uh, still lingering on here, like auto center grade separation. So we'll, we'll clean that up. But I, I know it's the Calico project's being cleaned up right now. OK, great. And then uh, Chase Drive was just um, installation of the storm drain swale system, construction of sidewalk bike from Sun Risa to Garrison. That's that's great. That, that's uh, that's definitely needed. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, the uh, infra State Route ninety one corridor. I believe this is our uh, contribution to the uh, major uh, freeway projects that are being funded and and uh, implemented by RCTC with the seventy one ninety one with the uh, 15, the toll roads. So this is the city's contribution for those projects. Okay. And uh, the infamous there, Oak Avenue street widening projects, as I mentioned to you before, we will begin construction in that in October. So we're on schedule on that. So I just wanted to highlight that to make sure that we are not forgetting that project. See, and again, the annual sidewalk curb and gutter repair. Um, we actually have the, that project going on annually, so that's a standard typical repairs for it. Um, and I believe that's, that's it. Thank you. Okay, and then moving on to the water projects, uh, Tom is going to provide some information on the water projects. Good afternoon. Uh, just to highlight a couple of the projects that we have. So we have a, uh, a 1220 booster pump station. As you know, we put in the zone five water line along Foothill. And this really kind of creates a unique zone in the, um, in the maybe Canyon area. So this is a 1220 booster pump station to help support some of the houses that are kind of a little bit below what zone five would be 1380 and then kind of in between where that next zone is. So this is a booster pump station to support that activity. Uh, additionally, in the program, we have uh, a couple of reclaimed water lines. One reclaimed water line to call out is on Old Temescal. This is going to go up uh, from currently the uh, Fullerton Avenue, and this will drop all the way over to where the I-15 is and pick up the pipeline that was installed by the developer. So it'll provide reclaimed water to the new development that's back off of I-15 there under that bridge. Um, on the um, following on page 28 of it, we have the Southeast Grand Quadrant Waterline Replacement Program. So the, the obviously the Grand Quadrant is one of the older um, areas of our town. And we the water lines that are in there uh, do date back sometimes to water and sewer lines will go back into the 1940s, 1960s. They're small and they run in, in between the alleys. So we've had a program in to replace those, relocate those out to the main streets and, and repipe some of that. So this project will actually go through all four quadrants of the circle over the next probably eight years. And this is the first quadrant that we're going This is somewhat of the first quadrant. We, with the hospital coming in, we took advantage of the infrastructure and construction kind of in that area on the southwest side. So some of the work has already been done in that southwest side, but this will move over into there. Correct. Um, following up on that, we also have a well 15 relocation with the 91 freeway expansion. The city of Corona owns a uh, well, or we have a well, multiple wells throughout town. This one is located off Pomona Road and Lincoln Avenue, 
kind of down in that area. And so we're actually going to relocate this uh, a little bit closer towards the freeway wall, free up a little bit of that land there for availability for uh, additional building. This is one that was a well that was impacted by the project or, or just it's the one that's there off of 3rd Street? It, this is the one that's actually off of Lincoln and Pomona Road. So it's across from Goodfellas, if you know where Goodfellas oh, is. Got it. Okay. It'll be in that general area there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Moody, really quick. Yes, sir. So I um, I'm, I know where that well is. There used to be the uh, Chronic Tacos right there in that same location. And when the freeway expanded, they took over part of it. So you're going to move that well closer to the freeway or closer to the overpass wall? Kind of closer towards the freeway, towards the overpass wall. So we're going to move it. If you were thinking of it, it'll be in that southeast corner of that property is where we're looking to move that well. And really what that does is currently right now we're positioned probably in the very center of that property. Mm -hmm. So um, we were north of Chronic Tacos and so in between the two buildings there. So we're looking to move it over towards the southeast corner and then allow that for more development make the property a little bit bigger. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then carrying on, we'll, uh, we're jumping into the water reclamation projects as well. So I'll just continue through with some of these water reclamation projects. The first water reclamation project that we're looking at, this is on page 31 or slide 31. Um, it, that's, I'm sorry, slide 29. I have 31 on mine. Um, the Sierra Del Oro lift station. So currently the Sierra del, Oro, Sierra del Oro lift station is abutted next to the tracks, the train tracks right below the storage area. We actually have been working on uh, securing the property uh, to the east of that location in that it'll bring it above ground and it'll allow us to get a little bit better flow and drainage. And then we'll be able to rebuild the lift station to, to newer standards where it'll have a wet well and a dry well. Uh, and a little bit more reliability and access for staff. One of the concerns, obviously, with that is that the uh, it's adjacent to a train tracks, so um, we would want to kind of try to move it from that location if possible. Tom? Yes, sir. Um, just confirming, though, that this isn't really going to do much with that odor that the residents are experiencing when they're idling there on Green River in the morning? It actually may help a, a bit. So one of the challenges with that is that sewer line going across or running down Green River is really flat. Um, when the lift stations, so there's two or three, there's three lift stations that are below this that are in the community down on Green River, and they pump up into this line. And so after that sediment sits for a little bit, it'll actually pump up into that line that's on Green River but then that line is really flat. So it requires the, the pumps to move quite a bit of water to kind of get that uh, H2S odor or the hydrogen sulfide odor out. So one of the things is that we can actually deepen it a little bit going to this new location and provide for a little bit better flow to hopefully ease that flatness, which flow uh, would then alleviate some of the odors. Thank you, Tom. Um, on slide 30, uh, water reclamation facility number one, dryer rebuild. We've been doing a lot of work uh, over the last year and some months to uh, evaluate. Uh, we've looked at insurance carriers for the dryer. And so we're at a point now where we actually want to take this out to bid and begin the construction and design phases of it. So this is to help support that construction and design of the dryer rebuild. And I believe that's it. Yeah, so this next slide gives you um, a snapshot of the CIP timeline and where we are in the process. Um, it has been presented to the Parks and Recreation Commission already to see the, the projects that relate to them. Um, the Planning Commission will review the projects in May, and then we'll be bringing it to you again at one more workshop on uh, May 13th, or I'm sorry, May 18th with the proposed budget document in whole and then for council adoption on June 2nd. Kim, real quick, if I can jump in. I just sure. want to make note for folks watching us that um, the, the documents that we're going over are attached to the agenda, and attached to the agenda is this really neat description document that follows along in the same order as the presentation. Yes. So if you, when we're asking questions, oh, what, what is this about, what's that about, that project description 
document covers what each line item is about. So thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, can I make a request? Since we only have one item and we have several folks in the audience, would, would you mind if between this and then going to the service changes, if we were allowed people to make comments, just oh, I hate sure. to squeeze all these in because it is a lot Are of Are folks here for the service change conversation? All right, let's see. Kim, where can we, can we move, move things around so we can accommodate folks to make Sure, well, we, we, were gonna, changes? we were gonna pause here anyways to talk about um, capital projects and then we were gonna move on to service requests next. Okay. Kind of what I was thinking, oh, right. yeah. I don't know if anybody you know wants to make a comment, but we have several people, I just wanna give them a chance. So, so it looks like we're coming up on that next. Yes. So, yeah, okay. Okay, any, any questions or? or uh, any questions from my colleagues capital on projects? capital improvement projects? No, we kind of asked them along the way, so okay. I think we're good to go. Perfect. Okay, so then moving on to service change requests, and these are items that are in the operating budget that are in addition to uh, what the department's already had in their baseline um, operating expenses. And attached. Huh? So normally we take the items and then folks ask a comment. If anyone would really just needs to get out of here, come on up, we'll take your comments right now. Go I, ahead. I, what, I didn't, what I didn't want to do is that we just, I mean, we went through 40, 30 something slides, and then we have another, you know, a few other slides. Right, we're taking them in chunks. Anybody to give a chance to, if they had comments on these, I don't know if anybody does, but I didn't want to limit people to three minutes for 70 slides. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay. Thank does you. anyone have any comments about the capital improvement projects? If so, go ahead and come on up. Seeing none. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> okay, so attached to the agenda with this presentation with the service change requests, um, there's a list of service change requests. They're grouped by the strategic goal uh, by department and then sorted alphabetically by the title of the request. Also indicated on that, um, that handout is uh, whether or not the item is considered for Measure X funding. There's a little column there with a check mark if the item is being considered for Measure X funding. So the first strategic goal is financial stability, and we have one item that's being requested in this next fiscal year that falls under that category. It's about 130,000 for an asset management coordinator, and that will help us fulfill that strategic goal of doing um, the asset management plan. Uh, this is kind of a kind of merges into two different areas: financial stability and sound infrastructure, because it'll really help to set us up in the future to make sure that we're managing those assets appropriately. For strategic goal number two, a strong economy, we have about $73,000 requested in operating expenses, and that's just to help to expand uh, current economic development activities and allow uh, that group to do just a little bit more with, with the resources that they have. So moving on to strategic goal number three, which is sound infrastructure. Uh, with this group of items here, uh, fulfill some needs for equipment, um, staffing in public works and maintenance services. Uh, you can see one of the largest items. We'll talk about a couple of the, the higher valued items. And then again, if you have any questions on any of the other ones, we can definitely go into those as well. So uh, there is a tractor with a one-time cost of uh, about 389000 from DWP funds. And that's for a replacement tractor at water reclamation facility number one. We have a CIP manager um, in the Public Works Department and a CIP project manager that would be requested, as well as a traffic signal te technician and a street light maintenance technician. And then the, some of the other items on this list are for different maintenance and some part-time positions as well. The very last item on this list is for a collection of items that were valued at $10,000 or less, and so they're just combined here for it, so we didn't go on for many, many slides for, this, for the category. <laughs> So the total in this group is about $1.1 million for sound infrastructure. And you can see that is across different funding sources, um, general fund, DWP funds, and in the other funds column, um, those are things like gas tax, um, the lighting maintenance district um, are items that are included in that category. Um, Ms. Sitton, you know how much I love tables, and I just have to say that I really love this um, supporting document for... Um, what we're going over and how it um, breaks down whether or not it's you know, coming out of Measure X, whether it's recurring or one time. I just really appreciate oh, that. Thank Thanks. you for all the work. Thank you. 
So moving on to strategic goal number four, which is safe community. And you can see there's quite a bit of requests under this item. Most of them are in the uh, general fund. This group totals about $4.9 million. And the items in this category fulfill some needs in the fire department, police department, and the code compliance division in community development. And again, that very last line is grouping um, items in this category that were $75,000 or less are grouped. Again, so we didn't have to go on for, for many, many slides here. Um, but just highlight, highlighting a couple, couple of the items here, we have um, the firefighter paramedic squad unit. What's shown here is actually one-time costs for vehicles and equipment with the potential or the, um, the plan that the recurring costs for staffing would actually occur in the next fiscal year. We have some uh, corporal positions for police, an administrative battalion chief for fire, a police lieutenant, um, an administrative fire captain, uh, some code enforcement officers, community service officers for the police department, and then some dispatching assistants as well, as well as a couple police officers and two dispatch safety call takers. We have uh, the graffiti removal contract services, which we'll get more information on tomorrow at the study session. Uh, 911 dispatch manager, a co-compliance supervisor, and then some training costs. Any questions on those items? No, there's just there's a lot of really good progress here. Um, it's a lot of what we've heard from residents um, wanting to see action on, and I'm just, you know, here it is, slide 36, and in your description it starts on uh, page four. Um, a lot of good content. Do my colleagues have comments? Just had a really quick, I just wanted to ask, Chief, how, how many new officers does this number four give you? Yeah, so uh, number four. So we're asking for a total of five uh, sworn officers in this budget request um, with a total of 24 personnel, so five, 19 um, professional staff people and five officers to assist us in our growth. And, and of that 19, how many are CSOs? We're asking for four community service officers. That's awesome. Yeah, five, oh. five new, five new uh, folks with with uh, guns and badges, and and four new people to help those people out. I, I love that. Thank you. Yes. Four new CSOs Mayor. and two new code enforcement officers. Yes, code enforcement from uh, Miss Coletta's shop, and then uh, right. we're asking for the cadets as well, which I believe, as we talked about, will uh, be another uh, application for us to free up our officer resources. Five part-time cadets. Yeah, it's a lot of really good things here. Thank you. How do you provide security for park restrooms? I, I got to know. Did you just rip those dudes out of there? Or? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, we are. We want to make sure that um, those restrooms are properly secured at night. And so um, our janitorial staff open those up in the morning to make sure that they're clean and ready to go. But we want to make sure that all of those restrooms are closed in the evening. Um, and we want to make sure that they are secure so that folks are not going in there at night um, and using them as a place to live. And if I can just add on to that, this really addresses a conversation that we've been having over the past year where we've either sort of the the, uh, the pendulum has swung to locking the restrooms all the time in order to protect, you know, the faucets and fixtures from being ripped out or opening them and having them destroyed. And so this is a in-between bridge that allows us to leave them open during the day, during usual business hours, but but making sure that we've got somebody around to lock them at night so that we're we're trying to open them up for those that need them for legitimate uses but also making sure we secure them at night so that we're not uh, seeing too much destruction. That's good stuff, thank you. Mayor, I have two questions. Go ahead. Uh, first question for Chief Newman. Um, with the, if, if the addition of four uh, CSOs, what does that bring the total to? We will have 10 at that point. Thank you. And then for Dr. Turner, uh, just a quick question regarding um, the opening and closing. So could you provide me uh, a snapshot on what those hours really look like for anybody that's paying attention as far as Monday through Sunday hours of that the restrooms are open and when they're closed from. They're open during the park hours. So the park opens, uh, the park opens early in the morning uh, and it closes by 10 o'clock at night. So we want to make sure that all of those restrooms are closed no later than 10 o'clock at night. It also gives us that additional presence in the park, which is really important for us. Um, a lot of times at night, we don't have 
staffing or we don't have folks that are in the park, uh, we think that it will be a deterrent for nefarious activity if we have um, somebody in the park who's coming in, closing, showing themselves at night and, and, and closing those restrooms as well. That's seven days a week? It is. Our parks are open seven days a week. Thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to uh, strategic goal number five, sense of place. Again, this group of requests uh, fulfills some needs in community services for different programs and staffing. It also fills some needs in the communications division. So just highlighting a group at the beginning here, there's the, the park ranger program, adding two new uh, recreation program coordinators, a facilities parks and trails manager, a tree, tree pruning baseline budget, a parks planner, a trails planner, a park ranger supervisor, a community uh, volunteer coordinator, um, a program recreation program co coordinator for fields, parks, and sports, a recreation program coordinator for special events, a digital journalist, and some one-time monies for branding professional services, to name a few. This is also one of my favorite slides. Um, I'm so I'm excited about having a special events program coordinator. We've been hearing a lot from the community about wanting to have just more events that welcome us, especially coming out of the pandemic. <laughs> Folks want to get together. They want to have, they want to come together in community. They want to experience events, um, especially cultural events together. And so I'm really excited about that. I'm also thrilled about the digital journalists. And I want to, I'm, I'm excited about the park ranger program and I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Well, I hate to be my own teaser alert. This budget is, should have really come after the, the study session tomorrow. I kind of am blowing it. I, I, it, it, you, you know, I, I don't get to unveil tomorrow. Um, so we are looking at a park ranger program. I think it fulfills many needs that we have. With the increased open space that we have, we want to make sure that we have a presence on our trails as we intentionally work as a community to create the culture that we want to have in our open space and around our trail areas. Um, and as we move to, to take the trails master plan to sort of that next level and really talk about that piece, park rangers will be a key uh, part of that. But in our urban parks, park rangers serve an enormously important purpose, which is our police can't be in our parks all the time. And there's lots of stuff happening in our parks. And as a way to get our parks back into our communities and seen as assets in our communities, we need that, that person that is that fine balance between education, greeting, customer service, and enforcement. And we do have a lot of folks who use our fields who actually don't have permits to use our fields. They see an open field and they jump right on it. A park ranger is a perfect person to come and let them know with just that right presence. You know, hey, do you have a permit? Oh, you don't. Well, this is how you get a permit. And, you know, really this field is going to be allocated for somebody else. They also, again, with a truck that says park ranger on it and a light bar on it, sometimes just driving around through some of our parks, it's a little discouraging for people who want to kind of lurk in the dark and do some things that we don't want them to do in our parks. And we are truly pleased that we think this park ranger program will serve as a deterrent to some of the graffiti, particularly that we're seeing in our parks. Um, graffiti happens in off hours. It happens in the dark. It happens when people think nobody is looking. And what I'd like for any park user to feel when they come to Corona is that we care about our parks. We're paying attention. And so you too should care about our parks and know that you can't do that here. Uh, and I think that park ranger program just says that in volumes. Thanks for the teaser. Looking forward to the full presentation then tomorrow. And, and I'm happy to see a line item for our parks ambassador program too. It's a good tie in there. It's perfect. And on this slide, similar to the previous slides, uh, that the bottom line is a grouping of uh, requests that were less than $75,000 each. Those have been grouped together. But the attachment to the agenda um, does have the full list and the full breakout of, of every item that's included. So moving on to the last strategic goal, the high-performing government. Um, this group of requests fulfills uh, systems upgrades and staffing and some other needs in our more internal uh, service departments, such as the uh, information technology, human resources, and management services. 
So going down a few of these items as well, uh, the utility billing software upgrade, which is about 300,000, a development services manager for the public works department, an assistant to the city manager, a senior business systems analyst, which would be in the IT department, and a systems administrator for the IT department, an organizational training and development officer for human resources, a GIS administrator for IT, and then again, like with the similar, uh, with the previous slides, the, that very last line item is items grouped, um, but in this case, it's items less than 50,000. So real quick, to sum up the service change requests, um, they are a net total of 61 full-time positions, 11 and a half part-time positions, or FTEs. They total $10.3 million, uh, $2.7 million of that is one time, and $7.6 million of that is recurring. So that's about 26% one time and about 73% recurring. And we'll pause here for any questions. Thank you. Questions from my colleagues? Um, those stats that you just gave, are they in here somewhere? The ones that you just gave, the the... the the addition of personnel, et cetera? You know, they're not in there. So um, it's, if you look, no, they're not in there. Could you sure, send that out separately? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Do any of my other colleagues? Are there any speakers that wanted to speak to this item? Go ahead. Um, good afternoon, Council. I'm Elizabeth McCreary. I'm the chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission, and I'm coming to let you guys know that I'm excited to have not only a council, but staff that are excited about improving our parks. Um, Dr. Turner is who our parks have been missing, and she has a plan to not only bring our parks back up to baseline, like she mentioned, but to make them something to brag about. Um, but we can't get there without the staff and the funding. Um, funding is needed to support the staff, but staff is needed in order to really utilize that funding in the, in the best way. Um, I worked for Parks and Rec as a teenager here for the city of Corona, and the second floor used to be full, packed, and our programming reflected it. We had special events. We had Christmas parades, um, Halloween craft things, um, Tiny Todd Olympics, all sorts of amazing programming. Um, sorry, that we're missing right now. And um, now when you go up there, it's almost empty. So I really, really hope that you guys, she knows what she's talking about, and those are the things that we need to be amazing. So thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Okay, let's go to the next, next um, section. Okay, the last section. So this is how everything then rolls up into our proposed Measure X allocations. So we have eight different community priorities when looking at how to allocate out the Measure X funds. Uh, they are economic recovery and development, public safety, service improvements, proactive debt retirement, homelessness, infrastructure investments, parks and recreation, and community building. So in the first group is economic recovery and development. Um, we've split that, this out just a little bit differently than what we presented at the Spring Financial Workshop. So you can see we have recurring costs, one-time costs, and the total that would be included in next fiscal year's budget. And then we have um, a breakout of what would be reserved. So in this particular group, um, everything including the reserves represents about 3.3% of Measure X funding. And this represents recurring costs for staffing additions. Um, these are the economic development administrators that were approved at mid-year, as well as uh, some one-time costs for um, economic development activities. And this is a reserve that would set up um, funding to support redevelopment efforts, property rehabilitation, and uh, downtown land acquisition. That reserve amount would um, not necessarily be programmed into the budget at this time. It would be reserved in fund balance. And then when it's time to actually tap into those funds, a request would come to city council for an appropriation. Can I have a question. I, I thought the city, I'm hoping the city is allowed to, but I, I thought cities couldn't purchase land anymore for downtown or for any revitalizations. Can they in California? 
I'll let Jessica speak to this. I'm not aware of any prohibition of cities uh, purchasing land. It, certainly, we don't have a redevelopment agency anymore in the sense that it used to be. But uh, Jessica, do you want to take that one? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. So there aren't any existing prohibitions. Uh, you might be perhaps referencing to disposition of city-owned property and regarding some new regulations that are designated for excess surplus land. But currently, there aren't any prohibitions for obviously going through the proper RFP process and putting things on the market. So the city could purchase lands, vacant lands, any lands in the downtown area? Yes, the city could, of course, go in through the normal negotiation transaction uh, process. And certainly, this, these funds are intended to be given us flexibility as we're embarking on our downtown revitalization plan, as we're having conversations about how we can assemble certain parcels to be able to more effectively revitalize greater chunks of our downtown. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so moving on to the next category of uh, public safety. You can see here there's recurring costs of about $3.1 million, uh, one-time costs of about 2.9 for a total of almost $6 million with reserves set aside for $2.1 million. Um, in this category, we have police uh, staffing, additions and reclassifications, some different equipment and assets for the police department, uh, fire staffing additions, as well as some fire assets, and then um, staffing additions in the code compliance area. Bless you. Sorry, and that last group represented about 26.9% of Measure X. So service improvements here, we can see the breakout of recurring costs of about 706,000 and one-time costs of about 37,000 for a total of 744,000 and then reserves of 2.6 million. Uh, this group covers department staffing requests for positions um, as well as reductions in contracted services, which would help to offset some of those um, adjustments. Also records management system, intern program, leadership forum, training and development. And some of the programs we'd originally discussed at that spring financial workshop didn't necessarily make it into the budget quite at this time. For instance, the asset management plan, we need to bring on the asset management coordinator and then we'll start developing that plan. So that's why some of the things are being set aside as a reserve. And again, like with the economic development, then we'll come to council to actually tap into those funds and appropriate them in the budget when we're ready to do so. So proactive debt retirement um, for the recurring costs of $126,000, that's really the increase or the change in the general fund from the current fiscal year's PERS costs to next fiscal year's PERS cost. The amount that we're showing set aside in reserve, um, we would either put that into the Section 115 trust or use that as additional down payment um, towards a PERS unfunded liability. Some of that information will come to you as we continue to work through the pension obligation bond process. And again, anything shown in reserve isn't, would not go into the budget at this point. It would be set aside and we'd come back to you for an appropriation. In the homeless cate homelessness category, it's about $1.8 million in recurring funding. Um, this is funding the, the full-time homeless program coordinator and then the operations of the um, homeless shelter and the motel voucher program, some HOPE team overtime and then some cleanup efforts for the right-of-way and park encampments. And this represents about 5.9% of Measure X allocation. Ms. Sidden, and this doesn't factor in any potential grants that we get to cover some of those, so yeah, great. Correct. Right, yeah, so this is just the general fund portion. So this is, the, this is the maximum amount. Yeah, what's our, we, we're getting uh, three million, the total, it's something like yeah. five million invested, we're, we're right. putting in one point. Yeah, and it certainly seems like there's gonna be uh, those been a pretty massive shift at the state level for <clears throat> opportunities for us to find even more money. So, uh, If I could jump in on that, absolutely. And Karen's going after those. And as you know, we've yep. already received quite a number. This is really just making sure that we have set aside sustained funding on an ongoing basis to address these things. Uh, if we get grant funds, awesome. If we don't, we know we're going to maintain at least the baseline of addressing the homeless problems. In that's, the that's all I wanted to ask. Thanks. Then moving on to infrastructure investments, um, recurring funding of about 350,000, one time of about 2.3 million for a total of 2.7 million in next fiscal year's budget, and then reserves of about $1.8 million. This category represents 15% of Measure X allocation. And you can see a list of the projects here, streets, 
6th Street renewal, tree replanting, um, asset management plan, security cameras, uh, city facility improvements. Uh, those are items that would fall under this category. The alleyway project is one of the big ones under the one-time funding here. Ms. Sitton, real quick, we also, just to draw back to this um, supporting document, everything that is being presented now that's Measure X of a Measure X project is also listed in the supporting document, and you can find it um, by going down the column, the Measure X column, correct? So the operating budget items are correct. The CIP items were not necessarily identified in that way. And when we come back with the proposed budget, we will bring you a full schedule that shows everything CIP and operating that's being allocated out to Measure X. In so the same the format? Breakdown. In the same kind of format? Yes, we can okay. do it in the same kind of format. Thank you. And under the Parks and Recreation Group, we have about $1.7 million in recurring funding, about $3.1 million in one time for a total of $4.7 million. And then about $4 million would be uh, set aside in reserves. The staffing additions that we talked about under service changes would be community volunteer coordinator, program coordinators for various programs, the park ranger program. Also have uh, different um, recreational programs, such as the trainee program, softball costs for adults, graffiti removals, skyline trail weed abatement, park security services, and then park improvements are really what make up that one-time um, allocation. And then money set aside for future park improvements as well in the reserve. Real quick question. I didn't <clears throat> bring it up on the last time. It was about, well, that's probably why, because it's under fifteen under 75,000. For the skyline trail weed abatement, um, that's a, it's a county road and they've always covered the the grading and, and abatement on those roads. Is this something else? So I think we've called it skyline weed abatement because it's adjacent, but it's about the weed abatement that we have to do on the properties that we've just acquired. And it's and the weed abatement Got it. in okay. that area to be compliant so that we don't create any, any issues there. So Did I asked this question last time. I don't I know. Like total deja vu right now. This is really if you weird. asked it, I answered it, and I'll answer yeah, you it again. you answered exactly the same way. So <laughs> if it was either in my dream or, or earlier, you did. You answered exactly the same way. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and the total funding here um, equates to about 29% of Measure X for the Parks and Recreation Group. Okay, in the last category, community building and engagement. Let's see 374,000 in recurring funding, uh, 150,000 in one time for a total of about $524,000. There's staffing additions here, for, such as the digital journalist, the special events coordinator, the broadcasting technician. Um, we have some money set aside for special event sponsorships, as well as some digital outreach money and a refresh of the city's brand. Uh, this represents about 1.7% of the overall Measure X allocation. Okay, then to bring the whole... Can I make a suggestion on that? The For the digital um, portion, there at the library in the Heritage Room is a digital collection. Is there any way that that can be rolled into this? Because when you go online to access those documents and photos, they're, they're not high-resolution <laughs> scans, and it's frustrating. And if, if we're going to get digital... I think our history collection should be rolled into the digital. You guys just keep blowing all of my like unveils. Um, so um, yes, we are one of the things that we're moving forward with as we talk about the 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 heritage room is 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 coming back to council and talking with you, um, particularly about what are best practice uh, with special collections. Uh, and historical documents, and, and most of what we're hearing and finding as we're doing our research and developing our own policies is that the digitization uh, and that high resolution and the ability to access it online and actually go through the catalog online in the comfort of your own home um, is really what most of the, the libraries are moving to now with these very precious special collections. And so um, we're going to come back to you and talk to you a little bit about that later. Sorry, sorry, everyone. Mayor, can I ask one quick question? I, I was curious, um, and I hope I don't blow another unveil, but I, I'm kind of curious what a digital journalist is, and also, 
and also and also a broadcasting technician. Yeah, I'll speak to both of those. So the, the digital journalist is your on-the-ground person to support our communications team. They're going out and capturing B-roll. They're, they're helping with the, the collecting footage. As you know, we have two people in the city that, that do that as a full-time basis. It's very difficult to both go out and capture the footage as well as do a great job of orchestrating the overall engagement plan, edit videos, and produce those. And so this is really adding a third body. Still the leanest group I've ever seen in a city that wants to really get out there and connect with the community on a more regular basis. But this is really that, uh, that first level person that goes out and captures that. Think of them as being a journalist, um, except that most of the work that they do is digital. Uh, so hence the term. Uh, your second question is the broadcasting position. So right now the city has four part-time broadcasters. This would look at bringing in a one full-time broadcasting person who oversees that group and also just helps us do a better job with our overall broadcasting experience. Very challenging also having four part-time people with, uh, if you ever haven't had a chance to tour the back room where our broadcasting equipment is, you'll find it is a, I, I don't know how many hundred thousand miles of wiring we have um, in there, but it's a, it's a bit of a tricky system that's been patched together over time. And so having someone that gets familiar with that we hope and believe that we will have less of those, um, shall I say, awkward moments during our council meetings where things aren't working. And uh, by having that continuity that somebody gets used to it, the example I use is at, at home when you have uh, maybe your home entertainment system, they all have these little glitches that you get pretty familiar with and you know exactly how to fix it because you're used to it. Um, if we have a lot of different people coming through the, uh, the door on a part-time basis, then we lack that sort of inherent knowledge of the system. So when something goes down, you don't have that person that can quickly get it back up and running. Right now, our IT group, as well as our communications group, does an amazing job. You'll see Sean sometimes come in, he's glistening with sweat because of a problem that's happening and you've got half the IT department in there and they are all trying to piece something together that none of them individually always are that familiar with because it's got a lot of hands on it. The intent here is that by having a single source that's overlooking that, that we have a better broadcasting experience overall. This is somebody that is a little bit more technologically proficient than unplugging something and plugging it back in. We, we believe so. Thank you. Thank you. That's what happens at my house. Okay, so this... Uh this graph here brings all that information together that we've talked on the previous slides. And Mayor, we did do our best to do the different shading colors, but we ended up about 20 different pieces of the pie and it looked so busy, we ended up just... The, the colorblind guy's seal of approval that I can tell all the different colors, so oh. thank you so much. <laughs> Very good. Um, so you can see the breakdown. We've talked about the different percentages on the previous slides and then this is just gives you kind of a final snapshot of all the different categories, what would be in recurring funding, one-time funding, and then the total that would actually be incorporated into next fiscal year's budget, as well as the very far right column in that, that table at the top shows about $13 million would be put aside in reserves. I think this really speaks to what the voters had in mind for this measure. I mean, 29% into parks and recreation, and 269 to public safety, and 15 into infrastructure. That's what, we, that's what I heard loud and clear, so I'm, this, is, this is good. And debt retirement, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and so then this is the the next to the last slide. Is this shows then how all of that information breaks down with recurring one time and reserves. So taking that thirty million dollars, um, about twenty eight percent of it would be in recurring funding, about eight point four million dollars. One time funding would be eight point five million, or about twenty eight point three percent, with reserves at thirteen point one million, about forty three point seven percent. This too, I think you, you all did a good job of, of hearing us last time about bringing down the recurring costs and really trying to stretch these dollars out for a little bit longer. So thank you. And we'll pause here for all any right. Do my colleagues questions? have questions? Go ahead. Uh, no questions really. I just, um, I love this. You know, it's uh, probably the first time in 14 years that I've been excited about the future of Corona. And um, we have the leadership in place, we have the professionals, uh, we have a lot of newfound energy, and we got the money now to start making some things happen. So I think, um, I think our future is very, very bright. I love that we're getting rid of that stupid armory. Um, I love the park ranger program. I mean, there's so many things that you can, that you can talk about with this. 
Um, that was pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And I'm really glad that we're not over allocating on the reoccurring funds right out of the gate here. I think it's a very cautious and smart approach. So thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, council member. Oh, good grief. Um, I, I catch a lot of hell because I ran on no on X <laughs> and, uh, one member of this council particularly always razzes me on it. No. I won't that, would, that would be me. I wasn't going to mention her name. But. I told him. I told him he ran against it, so he can't vote for anything about the spending on it. <laughs> she, she's told me ten times. Um, I I like the transparency. I like the is one who is not afraid to go to that podium and speak out. Um, that there's transparency and that everybody can see it. I like that what Council Member Steiner said and our illustrious mayor that the people are getting what they're paying for and, and there's value in that. And uh, Dr. Turner, for the love of all that's good and holy, please let Tony drive the park ranger truck <laughs> when when they get it. I'm going to vote for that right now. I'm ready to, let ready let to them vote. work the lights. That's vetoed. I don't I know think, about Tony that. can't drive anything. I think we've already <laughs> established that rule. Thank you, Council Member. And make sure it has a PA system on it. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. You know I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, go ahead, Council Member. What Tom doesn't know is that I already drive through the parks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and the alleys. I don't know. The alleys seem to be really calling my name. Um, I, I would like to uh, just really speak quickly, just speak on the um, professionalism of these of these reports. I personally would have loved it if you would have led with these two because I was frantically writing down percentages that when I got to this page, I thought, well, crud, there they are. <laughs> But I'm very excited to see that the, uh, that, tw that the largest piece of the pie is going to our parks, um, our parks and Recreation Department. I you know, was canvassing this past weekend with Dr. Turner and her group uh, regarding a park that most people didn't know was a park. And uh, so I'm very excited to see that, that our parks are going to get a lot of love um, because over the last year and a half, I myself have spent a lot more time in parks than I ever thought that I would because of... Uh, the pandemic, and I have really enjoyed seeing them and utilizing them and even some of our new parks. So I'm very excited that our parks is going to get some much needed love and updating. Uh, I think that Dr. Turner has done a great job, um, you know, moving forward with some with some great plans. I'm also excited to see that the public safety uh, piece of the pie isn't the largest. Um, however, it is it is much needed, and I think that there's going to be a lot of good that comes out of that. So. Thank you very much for the professionalism and the transparency of these reports. They are great. I will actually not fall asleep reading these. I will be going through these because I have a few more questions that I want to get out, but uh, this is a great job so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to let uh, Councilman Nadario know that you can look ahead on those slides. So <laughs> it's totally okay. I did it yesterday and, and the day before, the day before that. Um, I, uh, I'm going to pile on a little bit here and just say that that this is exactly what um, you know Measure X said it was going to do, and and I'm happy to see uh, two things. One, the that that pie is a is a great shape pie. I don't like pie period, but um, uh, but the percentages and how we uh, we are allocating for our our, our reoccurring costs at 20. percent I think that I mean really echoes what we all you know we've all said you you've done it you guys have done a fantastic job and also that it gives us room to look and see how these service level changes go how we're going to implement those one time monies and what's going to come next and that's why you know my questions to to uh <clears throat> to all the staff here um so i think it's a it's a it's a place for us to grow i was happy that it didn't come out and and really look at at gobbling up all that and and not the public not having something they could see touch feel and experience. And I think if you look at all these things, it, it does all of those. And I, I didn't give, uh, you know, Chief Young any, any love, but we also, we added a, a few in the, a, uh, a lot of folks on the fire side too. So I didn't give you a chance to, to say how many of those were. So I'll, I'll quiz you real quick. How many, how many, uh, uh fire, uh, personnel did we add in this budget? So we had eight full-time, uh, operations personnel and then one non-operations and three part-time. And then um, we have how many? And then we just had another group of uh, cadets start. Yeah, so we have three that are finishing up 
their mini academy on Friday, and they'll hit the floor next week. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, I've got to say, I'm just, I'm really proud of this budget. We haven't passed it yet, but I'm proud of our process, and I'm proud of how transparent and uh, this has been, and just the supporting documents as as a wonk, as a policy wonk. I mean, I, I remember in grad school, I went to participate in the uh, city of Burbank's budgeting process, and boy, was it just, it, it was, it almost felt like it was meant to be confusing. And our previous budget supporting documents, while they were clear, it wasn't as easy to follow along and find all of the information that you're looking for at a glance. You almost had to have like a minor in finance and in city finance in order to really follow along with the process of where is this money coming from? Why is it being used? How often is it going to be used? You know, what's, you know, what's the thought process behind it? And so I want to just thank you, Ms. Sitton, uh, Mr. Ellis, Mr. Bradley, the entire team for working so diligently in putting together just really professional supporting material and walking us through this budget workshop in such a solid way. It just, it shows staff, it shows the city that, you know, we've got, not only do we not have anything to hide, we're really proud of the work that's happening and we're proud of what's coming next and we really want you to see it. <laughs> it's here, it's written down, and here's where we're heading. So although Measure X is not our entire budget, I also just want to pile on with my, with my colleagues. I am proud of what we're doing with these dollars. It's really going to the places where the residents want to see it most. And I'm, I'm happy and just thrilled by the 29% going into parks and recreation and all the investment back into infrastructure and really all of the reinvesting into our public safety, which is what folks want to see and feel um, in their neighborhoods. So thank you for that. Let's see if we have any speakers from the public on this item. Ms. Edwards, did we receive any cards? Mayor, no, we did not. Okay. Then the floor is back to you, Ms. Sitton. Thank you. I just have one final slide just talking about what's next in the process. So three weeks from today, we have our final budget workshop, May 18th, where we'll do a wrap up. It kind of consolidates everything together um, and we'll show you uh, like the full proposed budget document. And then we'll be in, on May 24th, um, the Planning Commission will actually see the list of CIPs, and that will be before the full budget comes for, to you for adoption on June 2nd. And that's all I have for you, and we're available. Myself and the department heads are available for any questions you may have. Thank you. And again, I want to encourage anyone watching at home to um, take a look at this, these documents and these supporting documents attached to today's agenda. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Our study session meeting is tomorrow at 3.30, and we'll see you then.